In this lab, we're looking at alternate methods of measuring discharge. At Nogis Creek and Pigeon River, we did the traditional method, whereby we measured the width, divided it into equal panels, determined the discharge in each panel, added, added those up to get the total discharge. Here, we're going to look at some shortcuts and also some equipment that can be used for other methods. First one is the V-notch weir, and as you can see, it's rather temporary in nature. Uh, what's usually used is a sheet of plywood and a hacksaw, and a V-shaped notch is carved into the wood, or a rectangular notch can be carved into the wood. And depending on the shape of the stream, either one will be selected. The worst part of the work is pounding the wood into the ground. Uh, usually done with a sledgehammer and then of course the wood stakes that are put in to support the wood from being pushed over by the water. Then the discharge can be measured. One way is to measure the depth of the water over the V and measure the width and the area would be the half, half times the base which would be half times the width times the height, in other words the depth to the V, and then you would get a stream velocity meter and determine the velocity. And then of course you could calculate your discharge. If it were a rectangle, the area would be the width times the depth and you would put in a flow meter. It seems rather extreme for a rudimentary piece of uh, equipment, especially when there's no real guarantee, especially with the rectangle, that you're putting this down perfectly level. So what is preferred is getting a bucket and timing how long it takes to fill the bucket. And so say you had a bucket that held four liters and it took four seconds to fill, the discharge would be a liter a second and then you would just convert liters to meters and remember it's a thousand milk bags in one cubic meter. The worst part of this is if it's in the summer and you can imagine it being 38-40 degrees C uh, and uh, the place just being infested with mosquitoes. Lots of fun. And here's a shot of the two weirs, a sketch showing the bottom view with the water going over the top. This is a permanent V-notched weir uh, and it has a storm sewer outflow and I selected this slide because of the lovely vibrant pink color. Uh, it's not natural and don't be alarmed this is actually a biodegradable dye that is non-toxic and it is used by municipalities in dye tests. Uh, usually the dyes will come in um, pink, orange, or lime green, sometimes red. And the purpose is to determine the source of pipes that are flowing into the storm sewer. Especially storm sewers that have been around for a while, it, there, um, it's unknown what exactly is being fed into it. Perfect example is a field camp we had a number of years ago where unfortunately we had a late spring and the ice hadn't come off a lake up north where we were going for our camp. So we had to have camp in Lindsay. I know, let's uh, cross our fingers, hopefully it won't happen and we'll be off to Bark Lake. But uh, one of the activities was measuring, or sorry, collecting samples from storm sewer outflow and seeing what parameters we would find. The weather was very cooperative for us. It poured rain the night before, it poured rain the morning of, and alarmingly a bunch of students came back reporting that there was raw sewage coming out of a couple of those storm sewers. So it turned out that there were some older homes in town that were not attached to the sanitary. They were coming out at the storm. So what the city did was it went in and conducted dye tests. So it had a particular color of dye that it would flush down a toilet and depending on the color that came out of the storm sewer, 
they would be able to backtrack, find out which home was illegally hooked up, and then issue orders for them to have it repaired. And it was likely someone way back that was trying to cut corners or did it themselves or just, you know, let um, ran their pipe until they hit a sewer and they didn't know the difference between a storm and a sanitary and they just used whatever they could. It's also um, used to determine where um, runoff, or sorry, um, discharge points from parking lots go, especially around industries. If we have a, an industry illegally dumping, uh, we can run a dye test and prove beyond reasonable doubt that that is the route that it, it, that it would take for the spill to occur. I worked with someone in the city of Scarborough who had worked for years um, in the municipality and whenever there was a spill he could look at the color and he knew who fed into the storm sewer and he would automatically say that's company X and we'd go over there and sure enough we'd find stains around the storm culvert and be able to lay charges on them. And of course municipalities would do dye tests as well. It's up to the, the it's up to the municipality to notify the ministry when they are doing a dye test. The group that they notify at the ministry is the Spills Action Center, uh, known as SAC, S-A-C, and that is useful because if somebody calls in alarmed at a strange color coming into the stream, SAC can say, yes, thank you for calling in, we're aware of it, it's non-toxic, it's a municipality, they're doing a dye test and this is why. And the person feels better knowing that something is being done and they also feel better that they called in. They're not, you know, keeping awake at night thinking, oh, maybe I should have called it in. Um, just a thing about SAC, they, um, it's one of the best entry points for ET grads to enter the Ministry of the Environment. If that's where you're interested in going, it's a great way of getting your foot in the door. I'd say over a third of SAC are ET alumni. They go in, um, some of them like the shift work and choose not to leave. Others go in and while they are dealing with spill response, they talk to people all across the province because if it's after hours, they're coordinating the response. They're calling in the fire department, they're calling in um, whoever's, whoever else is needed. They are um, looking up information on hazardous chemicals. They have the chemical database right there and they're dealing with the environmental officers minute by minute. So if they do a good job and are personable, then when a job comes up in that area, that office will do what they can to get that SAC person hired in their office. This is another piece of equipment used for discharge measurement and this one is called the partial flume and it comes prefabricated. Here's a picture taken from a catalog and you just have to install it into the ground. Uh, it's typically used by industry um, that would include sewage treatment plants, water treatment plants, because they would be required by law to report the loading concentrations that are being discharged into the river. So they would take a chemical sample and they would also measure their discharge. One method of doing that is of course using the velocity meter and then they would have a set width that is constant and then they would just have to measure the depth. Rather than measuring it all of the time, they can do it with a flow meter. And here we have an old-fashioned one, the Stevenson's recorded, uh, recorder. The lid has just been flipped up, so they are changing the paper roll. They could also use a wireless or a remote mechanism that would measure the depth. And if they ever are, are in a situation where it's not working, they can do the old-fashioned method by looking at the stream gauge that is built into the side of it. And this would be good for calibration as well. Here's a cross section of the partial flume. Uh, the water's coming in um, fairly wide and it is converged. That is to increase the flow so that if there were a situation where the water flow was a uh, trickle and it was difficult to get a reading, something like uh, what we came across at Pigeon River, this would increase the velocity. So 
a reading could be obtained. And they also have a false gradient built in, same reason that as it goes down, they can get a good velocity reading so that they can come up with a number. This was shown in lecture. This is a gauge station permanent and when it is installed a full stream profile is is completed like what we did at Pigeon and Nogi's and then a stilling well S-T-I-L-L-I-N-G is installed. It is a three foot corrugated steel well and these are pipes that run from the river to the well and water will feed in here by gravity and the water level will rise until the water level is equal to the stream level uh, and the water level can be monitored with uh, a flotation device as well as a wireless device and this is uh, great for safety because if this is partially covered with ice much safer to get a reading from the well and this is looking inside a stream gauge station these little white things are things called snow um, I've seen a few flakes going by the window today so hopefully we'll see some soon all of these units measure discharge and if discharge is measured enough over time a correlation can be made between discharge and depth or stage of the water that information can then be plotted on a graph and with enough points a curve can be found and it's not line of best fit it's just connecting the points so that after a while discharge doesn't have to be determined every single time so you don't have to go out there and measure the velocity you can uh, remotely get the stream stage or elevation from say a gauge station plot it against the curve and then correlate it down and you can find out what the appropriate discharge would be so it's a time saver in the long run. Remember this because um, a second year had an interview with the Water Survey of Canada and in his interview he was asked what a reading curve is and what it is used for and he blanked unfortunately but um, hopefully you won't. <laughs>